Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement and its implications for the church today. Today, we are joined by our resident Ephesiologist, Michael. Uh, I am Andrew Johnson, Associate Pastor at Neartown Church in Houston, Texas, and we have the joy of being joined by Greg Henson, who is the president of Kairos University. Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, happy to be here. It's great to uh, be with your group. Okay, so we're pumped to have you. I We're not best friends yet, so I don't know everything about you. So uh, well, I would love for you to, to color in a bit of your story. So tell us some of your most important things. Yeah, happy to do that. So I think the most important thing is a uh, child of God, right? So I, I grew up in the church. I had the blessing of uh, my mom is a pastor uh, my whole life. My mom or my wife have been my lead pastor until we moved here to Sioux Falls. And there's a story for that. But the grew up in the church, loved it, but always had a deep passion for for discipleship. So uh, my whole life, it's been trying to figure out how do we how do we think about discipleship? How do we follow Jesus? How do we do these things? And but all my formal education was in business. So I was uh, this weird mix of love of the church, love discipleship, but really want to think about innovation and business and orange and organizational development and all of that. And for some reason, God put all that together in the context of theological education. And it took about a year in to me working at Northern Seminary before I worked here, uh, realizing, oh yeah, this is where all that stuff can kind of come together. So we've now been here in uh, Sioux Falls with Kairos University for a little over eight years, going on nine years now. And the, the thing that kind of drives us is how do we think about theological education as first and foremost, a journey of discipleship that happens to end in a degree. Uh, so it's not, it's not uh, how do we create people in the image of, of the academy? It's how do we create people in the image of Jesus and also award degrees in the process? Well, that's well, fantastic. And that's, yeah, that's, and that's one of the things that I've appreciated about Kairos and, and you, Greg, as I've gotten to know you over the past couple months, um, I came across Kairos. I don't even know how, actually. I, you know, we've been, Andrew, talking about theological innovation for a, a little bit and looking at ways in which people are innovating theologically, because we know that uh, the, the system that we have today is out of reach of a lot of people just because of the cost of theological education. And then, you know, all the other things that we've talked about uh, in this age of COVID as well, the accessibility of it and, and uh, uh, the relevance of it and those types of issues. And somehow I came across Kairos and I thought, gosh, I need to contact these guys. And wait, there's Larry Caldwell. I know Larry. Uh informally because of our, our uh, affiliation with the Evangelical Missiological Society. And so I reached out to Larry a few months ago and one thing led to another and we discovered that, boy, we, we really have a similar heartbeat in terms of our desire to bring theological education to uh, more people in a relevant, accessible, faithful, affordable way. And uh, one thing has led to another. Greg, you and I had many conversations while I was in India uh, early in the morning or late at night or, or something uh, yeah. while we were there and super excited about the fruit of those conversations and really excited about the partnership that we've developed. Yeah, likewise. I think the, the shared the shared passion for uh, stewarding followers of Jesus, right? It's how do we how do we walk alongside people that call Jesus Lord to help them flourish in what it is that that God's inviting them to do? And so it could be church planning, could be all different things, but it's it's definitely an exciting conversation to have. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that we're really excited about is the whole idea of collaboration and doing theology and community. And that's, a, of course, a heartbeat of a physiology as it is of Kairos University. But Greg, I'm curious, could you share with us a little bit about this collaborative uh, network that formed several years ago? Because it is, I mean, this is unique. 
yeah, yeah, in the field yeah. of theological education. Well, I, I'm happy to do that. And it kind of stems from, and you used, used a handful of words there when you're talking about, you talk, I heard you say affordable and accessible and, and relevant. And then you also threw that word faithful. And those are the four primary words that we use is affordable, accessible, relevant, and faithful. It turns out it's actually pretty easy to sell degrees in North America that are affordable, accessible, and relevant. You can, you can do that. There are schools that have grown you know, to hundreds of thousands of students on affordable, accessible, and relevant. We wanted to do affordable, accessible, relevant, but faithful as well. And so we talk about being faithful to the unshakable truth of, of God's word, but also faithful to the fact that theological education is something that needs to happen in community and have a transformational impact on people. And so in that, in that world, we think that theological education has to be a system of integrated and interdependent parts. It's not that the church is over here in one place and the academy is over in another place and the denominations are over here and parachurch places are over here and, and ministries like Ephesiology are over here. It's that's one body of Christ. And so how does that body of Christ think about theological education. So we talk about creating systems of theological education that are affordable, accessible, relevant, while remaining faithful. So we do that in a handful of ways. We've, we've got partners in different places around the world. We, we have students in about 60 different countries. We're doing things in several different languages, but it's all predicated on a more decentralized approach to partnership. So it's not how does Kairos build an empire of all these different places. It's how do we build like a, we call it a platform, uh, like a people and process based platform on, that can be leveraged by ministries and churches and church planters and, you know, pastors in rural Brazil that can then leverage that to, yeah, to follow Jesus and flourish in their vocations, whatever that might be. So we're not trying to export what we do to the global south or to to a ministry in, in india right we're trying to say hey you know if we read acts the spirit's doing a whole lot of awesome stuff <laughs> all over and so how do we actually leaven that rather than try to just export what we do and that's where the partnership comes in is there's a whole lot of great things like we tell it we, we talk about it jokingly within our faculty is seminaries are not the keepers of pedagogical truth when it comes to stewarding followers of Jesus in their vocations. Um, so there are some great things that are happening, but along the lines, we've stumbled or, uh, bumped into others, uh, either seminaries or ministries who have that kind of same, same idea is, yeah, let's, let's do this. And then let's do this together. So about two years ago, well, maybe it's the, the 2020, 2021 were the longest five years of my That's life. Right. How been for you guys. But the, whenever together. it was, it was pre pandemic. <laughs> and then during the pandemic, we've been kind of living into it. We had four other uh, accredited schools within North America reach out to us and say, Hey, we'd love to, to do this with you. Is there a way for us to do that together? So we've developed this, what we call a legacy partner system, which comes together with, there were four ATS accredited schools and then one ABHE school that all came together to, to foster and to kind of think about Kairos University. So we, we started something called the Kairos Project as Sioux Falls Seminary way back in 2014. And then that's grown as we've discerned the leading of the spirit to now what we call Kairos University, which includes Evangelical Seminary in Pennsylvania. Uh, BLI School of Ministry is also in Pennsylvania, Houston Graduate School of Theology is in Houston, and then Taylor College and Seminaries in Edmonton. And then we have partners like Ephesiology, and we have partners in Brazil and all these other places that are schools or ministries. And the whole driving force behind it is how do we work together f to steward followers of Jesus, not so competition is not in our lexicon. We would say that there is no such thing as competition in the kingdom of God. Uh, how do we, how do we just kind of live into that? Yeah. And I love that collaborative nature, uh, especially, I mean, it's so appropriate in the academy to be collaborative. And yet so often we, we seem to be more competitive than we are collaborative. And so I'm great. I'm grateful for that. Well, it seems that the, there's a whole lot in academia. Um, there's the one side, the the joy of education, right? And the joy of learning and growing and being molded into who you want to be, uh, taking on the career path or things like that that you want. But then also 
unfortunately, there's that business side of there's only so many dollars or sometimes that's how it's seen. There's only so many dollars. And so then everybody's trying to be in competition for those few dollars because they kind of like having jobs and working as institutions. And so they want to do all that they can to keep those dollars in their bucket and not have them walk somewhere else. But it seems this is uh, guided first and foremost by that faithful pursuit uh, so that it, it's the people who are a part of this are not seen as uh, dollar bringers or things just to keep an institution running. Uh, but Kairos coming alongside and saying, okay, you have been created in the image of God. You have been gifted. How can we help equip you to live into what God is doing in you, in your place, in your world for the good of his kingdom? That's, that's exactly right. And it's, it, we talk about it as a radical commitment to, for, to affordability. So a lot of times in theological education, when you hear the word affordable, what we're hearing is we're going to raise a bunch of money in scholarships to then offset the tuition costs for some people. And when we say some people, usually it's a certain type of people. Um, and the challenge with that, it's really just off, off loads the cost of theological education to some other part of the, the body of Christ. It's not really making anything more affordable. It's just yeah, it actually the, still costs. The, it's still the same cost, right? And so for us, when we talk about affordability, we actually have to radically redefine and radically reimagine what it means to function as an institution so that it actually costs less to educate a student. Um, and then when you do that, you can have tuition or whatever you want to call it be affordable for the student in their context, because affordability is a contextually defined term. And Michael and I have had these conversations. Affordable for a pastor in Northern India is not the same thing as affordable for a church planter in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And that's not the same, like the North side of Chicago is not the same thing as the South side of Chicago. Or the, My goodness, so, no, it is not. Yeah, so you have to, you have to think through the fact that affordability is not a kind of universally defined term. You have to recognize where it's coming from, which means you have to kind of reimagine what is a, what are you trying to do? And it's, you're not trying to sustain an institution. That's God. God is our sustainer. God is our provider. Uh, we're trying to steward whatever it is that God gives us. That's opportunities and resources mm -hmm. and people and, and stuff. And I think so many times schools spend so much energy and how do we, how do we get money and how do we man, maintain whatever resources that we have, which means we have less time to actually focus on following the spirit and doing mm -hmm. what the spirit's inviting us to do. Mm, I appreciate that. Seems like too, Andrew, you you uh, allude to this, and I want to dig into this a little bit more deeply. But it seems like theological education uh, often is thought of as a zero sum game, meaning that you know there are only a certain pool of people out there in the Christian world that we are going to prepare for ministry. And uh, what I think I appreciate or one that I know I appreciate about Kairos is that, it, I mean, that's not in the mentality. It's not that there are only a few people that need to be prepared, but we're talking about the church, church at large. So this isn't a, a zero sum game in terms of the uh, potential population uh, of students, is it? No, it's not. And I think we have the data to support that actually now. So Sioux Falls Seminary, which is now Kairos University, We've grown by 5,300% over the past eight or nine years. But if you look deeper into where that growth is coming from, the vast majority is, is from people who were never engaged in theological education or never planned to be engaged in theological education. Some of it is students around the world. You know, it's the rural pastor in Brazil who is paying $10 a month to engage in some sort of a journey of discipleship that happens to end in a degree. But it's also... Like our own denomination that founded the seminary, uh, we have seen almost a doubling of the number of people in that denomination who are enrolled in theological education precisely because of the accessibility and affordability that has come through Kairos. So it's not they were attending another school or whatever. It's It was 50 people, and now it's 150 people that are engaging in theological education. So when I hear schools like, oh, we got to compete for students or we got to compete for that, I'm like, there are so many people, like I heard you give the statistic the other day, Michael, there's something like 50,000 people a day that are getting baptized. Mm. We don't have enough seminaries to engage the, the number of people that are wanting to engage in theological education. We don't have enough of that. So it's not that we need more resources or we need more students or we need more of this. We actually just have to respond 
to what God's already doing mm. in the world. And the, uh, the other statistic I think that's helpful, at least in North America, if you put all the seminaries in North America together that are accredited by ATS, you know, it's something like 70 some odd thousand students, but we collectively have something like $8 billion in endowed funds hmm. as a group. And then every year we get another $2 billion in unrestricted giving on average. Like that's a lot that of, is a money lot of money for 70,000 students or 80,000 students, whatever the exact number is. Money is not our problem. <laughs> money is not the thing that we need to be worrying about. Mm. We need to be worrying about how are we stewarding what God's already given us. Mm. I, I love that perspective, Greg. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it's so much what we need. I mean, we need to, because God's at work, right? And we just need to recognize that he's at work and then ask the question, well, how do we join with that in what he's doing? And, uh, and that's what I think Kairos has done. Yeah, and I think it requires a rethinking of what it is that universities are supposed to do, uh, I think, uh, or, or seminaries, or what is theological education. And I think you have to, if our job is to sell degrees, then you're going to think about a certain way of doing that. But if our job is to steward followers of Jesus that happen to earn a degree, that's a, that's in a different a different approach that you can envision. Uh, mm. It's not that degrees don't matter or that you don't want to be academically rigorous and that's all stuff is all true, but it's the, in what, where's the priority? And I think what you find with schools and we were there, so Sioux Falls Seminary was totally there, is we, we build systems and structures uh, in you know, what was the German academic model and like, that's great. Let's use that to, tr to train pastors and develop church planners and to, you know, develop the firemen or the, like the chief of the fire department here in Sioux Falls was one of our students once upon a time. And, you know, doctors and lawyers and re working alongside those people, we just kind of assumed, well, yeah, let's just take the German academic model and use it because that's what's great. And I think what we're learning, you know, 250 years later or whatever it is, that maybe there's some other systems and processes we need to consider <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that might be more uh, in tune with what discipleship is. Yeah. And that's where I think you, if I'm not mistaken, this is where you go to competency-based theological education. Tell us a little bit about that. What's, what's the thinking behind uh, competency-based education? Yeah. So we, that's the category we get put in is competency-based theological education. And that's primarily because the, the government has two two categories. You're either a normal school <laughs> or you're a competency-based <laughs> school. And when we started, uh, we didn't actually call what we did competency-based education because uh, what what is generally construed as competency-based education in, in the wider higher education is not really what we do. But the the fundamental shift is away from, it's kind of a decentering of the 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 class or the course as the driving force behind education and instead saying what matters is the outcome uh, what matters is proficiency you either are proficient in the content character and craft relative to a particular category of learning or, or discipline or whatever or you're not uh, there's not a eh, he, he's, he's he's almost he, he's he's good enough or she's good enough or whatever they're good enough to get a to pass these classes and so we're going to give them a degree uh, the real shift was, well, what if we, what if we reorient it and reorient all the systems and all the structures and the payment system, everything around the goal is a faithful follower of Jesus who can demonstrate proficiency in all these different outcomes. And when you do that, it actually creates all kinds of freedom for the process. So it's not that courses aren't helpful or that learning experiences aren't useful, or you can do all of those things, but they become resources or tools that students use on their way of developing and demonstrating proficiency. But there's also so many other things. So if you have a church planter who is literally doing church planting while engaged in theological education, all of their stuff they're doing in, in that work can be leveraged towards these outcomes versus like you saying, I love that you're, you know, we have a, we have a woman who graduated and she was a hospital administrator. So she did a master of arts and focused on hospital administration within a seminary, which I thought was really cool. Uh, but she was able to craft that educational journey in ways that integrated her faith and her work um, and just used learning experiences or courses along the way. So the, the primary shift is one towards outcomes matter, the path can be flexible. 
And when you make that shift, you actually learn, oh, well, if the path can be flexible, charging people for credit hours makes no logical sense <laughs> because we're, that's not the thing that's building their proficiency. It's one of the resources that they use. Or you realize that, well, if we can't, if we're not going to do courses in the same way and we're not going to charge for credit hours, why do we have academic terms? Why do we have to have students start on the, in the fall every year? Why mm. can't somebody just start <laughs> when they want to start? It's and June so 12th. Today, I want to start. Yeah. Well, so that's what we do, right? So we do literally have students that start every day. You can start uh, a, a journey through Kairos literally any day of the year and uh, begin working with a mentor team to craft and customize your educational journey in light of the history and tradition, right? It's not like you, it's not a choose your own adventure kind of thing. It's here's some things that we need to pay attention to. And the student works with their mentor team to adjust that. And then we use a subscription price to manage all of it, uh, which dramatically lowers the cost for students. So I could talk for days about that, Michael, but <laughs> I it seems you're excited. I, I can't just a little bit. I, I care just a little bit, right? Just a little bit on this. <laughs> but maybe what I might add here at like one point is when people hear about what we're doing with our programs, most of them want to spend time talking about well, you know, what are the, what are the disciplines that people are studying and, and how are they studying theology and how are they, uh, how are your, how do your faculty teach these things? Or it's all program stuff. It's all, let's talk about, let's talk about content. Let's talk about this. And very few people get to the fact that what this process really does is open the doors to be responsive to what God is doing in the world mm -hmm. because it forces your, or at least invites you as an institution to reimagine everything. So your admissions processes change, your faculty roles change, your governance changes, your board changes, your literally every single thing changes. And that is probably, I would suggest the biggest issue. Um, we don't have any, we have all kinds of seminaries, ours included in the past, who can come up with great ideas and great programs. Oh, we need a new program on this and a new program on that. And we got to do this. If we just build new programs and don't give any thought to the fact that the underlying system is the problem. Mm. then we're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. And that's when it becomes a zero sum game then, because when you build a program, you're saying, I only want those students and there, there will be a limited number of those students. But what you're talking about is really a contextual theological education mm -hmm. that you're, the concern is for the student and their learning experience where they are uh, in their place of ministry or in their workplace and designing along with the student and the mentor team a pathway for them to achieve their goals not not the seminary's goals for them but for them to achieve goals that are going to be relevant for who they are yeah they're yep. going to be relevant and they're going to be informed by the tradition of the church and informed by the academy but it, they're not it's not just that voice so i think the, the way we try to talk about it is historically standards of excellence within theological education have been defined by a pretty small group of people relative to the wider church. And all we're trying to do in this process is say that those voices matter, but so do other voices. Mm -hmm. the, the, the people who have been pastoring uh, in the Ivory Coast for 20 years, but never engaged in theological education, those voices matter. Uh, when they were working with someone who is, right? So it's not just the faculty who are full-time at the institution whose voices have to be brought to the process. It's the voices from a particular context or a particular faith tradition, right? So we have within Kairos, we have 70 plus different denominations represented. And within those faith traditions, you have every the whole spectrum of theology within each tradition, right? So you can't say when you graduate from Kairos, you're going to have this theological structure um in terms of you know you're going to be reformed or you're going to be wesleyan or you're going to be this or you're going to be that it's you're going to have a coherent theological system that's true and relevant and informed by history but also connected to your context so if you're in a lutheran context you'd better know what the lutheran <laughs> what the lutheran confessions are what is the what is luther's confessions what are the book what's the book of concord you're gonna have to know some of that stuff if you're going to be in that context but if you're going to be in a in a Pentecostal context, you might not spend a whole lot of time on the Book of Concord. Mm, yeah, great. Yeah, I'd love the contextual nature of this. Uh, Michael, I do need to point out you uh, you mentioned a redundancy. You said wherever 
uh, you are doing ministry or where you work. It does it the same thing. So just want to want to encourage that where you are working is likely where God has also put you in ministry. Uh, so let me, let me put my my two cents out Preach. there. OK, um, so, Greg, this is the, the first time I've had the joy of talking with you. And there are so many good things that I am hearing about Kairos University. Allow me to be not the naysayer. Allow me to be this person who's going to ask. There are likely people either administrative types or seminary types, people who have been in the academic world for a very long time, and they've listened to all that you and Michael have said and all of the good things. And in the back of their mind, they're saying, yeah, Greg, that sounds great. I'm really glad this is working out for you, but wait until... And they have all of these things that they know are going to come against you or they feel are going to come against you. What are some of the things that you see lurking as not reasons why Kairos is not going to be able to succeed in all these things, but forces that are going to still come against that you guys have to mitigate or that you have to work against so that Kairos can continue to do all of the three A's that you want to with the faithfulness as well? Yeah, the, that's a great question. The, I think the, the things that we get asked about um, that people assume, well, eventually your accreditors aren't going to let you do this. Uh, and we have actually just recently had our accreditation visits with all of our accreditors that we are so we're accredited by the Higher Learning Commission and by the Association of Theological Schools, which is a fancy way of we have the same accreditation as Notre Dame, right? So it's those people, and both of them gave us the highest accreditation grades you can get. So that one is kind of we've gone over that hump already. The other check, one that we hear, box. yeah, like done. <laughs> that one's that one's good. Uh, uh, and we've actually been encouraged by those conversations, but that's a whole other, other thing. The, the other one we hear is, how is that going to work uh, with federal student aid? Um, and not just federal student loans, but, you know, or provincial loans in Canada. It's the, all of the aid. So there's, you know, VA benefits and all the other stuff, the GI bills and all those things that students can use as they're engaging in theological education. How are you going to deal with that? We hear that one. And the last one is, how do you build this kind of a collective um, engagement in disruptive innovation when the majority of people are not going to pay? So our, our price is $300 a month. The vast majority of people in the world, that is an unaffordable price. So how do you build a system when the price actually probably has to be $50 or $25 a month on average? which is, so 300 is already a fourth of what the average would be for ATS. Um, and what we hear people say, that's great, but how are you gonna go here? Those are the, the questions we get in terms of the future. Um, and I think we actually have pretty good, pretty good answers to some of those. Uh, some of it has to do with how you think about the onboarding process and how you stir it and walk alongside people. Some of it has to do with partnerships. So you work with people like a Fijiology who already have systems and processes in place. But the, the federal loans and in, in my world, the, the way to do that is to get out of them and not be part of the federal aid system. But that's a whole other conversation. The bigger questions we get are not about the future. They're more about how do you maintain quality? If you've got this many students in this many countries doing this many things in so many different languages, how do you have quality or and usually what they mean is consistency in all of that. And that's a fair question, right? If you've got a student who's doing uh, something in Portuguese in rural Brazil, and you've got a student in the Pacific Northwest who's doing something entirely different, how, where's the consistency and quality in that? And what we've tried to talk about there is historically in the academy, in that kind of German academic model, quality was defined by saying, if you have a certain type of person doing certain type of activities in a certain type of place, a classroom, um, with certain types of students in there over a particular timeline. So very particular, like quality is defined by the type of people doing what they're doing in a particular place. If you do those things, you will have quality. That's a, that's a really and strong equation. 
by the way. Right? Yeah, that, that's a whole boom, lot of boom, A boom. plus B plus C B. plus. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Right. But the problem is, and we have history of this, that that does not work. Like to assume that if you do that, you will end up with high quality results or consistent results. I mean, the, we have data from ATS that says, well, I mean, roughly less than half the people who start a degree within a seminary graduate. Mm -hmm. So the process is not doing a great job graduating people. We also have all kinds of stories, right? The person who graduated with a Master of Divinity and is not someone you would want to be your surgeon or your doctor or your lawyer or your pastor or whatever. Those things happen. So I want to highlight just a moment that what we're saying was quality and consistent maybe isn't quite the gold standard that we think it is. But alongside of that, we would suggest that quality is better managed through consistent, um, consistent expectations around the kind of processes. So we have a thing called a development process that is used by everybody around the world. So everybody that works with us uses this development process, but that development process doesn't prescribe the the journey it prescribes the way that mentor teams work with students to articulate and think about the journey and that kind of consistency and accountability around the conversations that are happening that i think is a better way to think about about quality but you know i'll own the fact that in our system and in our thinking in this collaborative network you have to embrace the idea that standards of excellence are contextually defined all standards of excellence are born out of a community of practice. We're just saying that community of practice needs to be a localized community. You mm -hmm. can't just assume that. So we have a student who is a missionary, Filipino missionary in Saudi Arabia. She is a youth pastor at a church plant in Saudi Arabia, but also a radiation technologist at a hospital in Saudi Arabia. We also have a student who is a middle-aged white guy pastoring a rural Lutheran church in South Dakota. To assume that the leadership standard of excellence for both of them needs to be the same is harm. Mm. Um, you can't, you can't make her be him and you can't make him be her. So if they are deemed competent and proficient in leadership in their context, that's great. But if you switch them, they're no longer competent. You can't just assume that she's competent here and she will be competent here and he's competent in this church and he could therefore be competent over here. The standards of excellence have to flow from the community of practice, not just from the academy. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. as you're sharing those things, Greg. I'm uh, sitting here as a faculty person, thinking, "Wow, what a what a great opportunity to build into people, um, and uh, and to think about what do the things that I know." How does that help? How does it not help? How do I adjust those things? So really, I mean, it's a challenge to me as an academic to think creatively, uh, to, to continue to be curious about learning, but not only about learning, but about what is being learned and uh, to think creatively about how do I communicate this in a way that's going to be meaningful for someone in Saudi Arabia or for somebody in South Dakota. And uh, what, what a great academic exercise. I think so. I'm biased, but I think you're exactly right. It is an invitation to creativity. It's an invitation to participate in what God is doing already around the world. It's, it's recognizing that your, your value as an, as an academic, your value as a professor coming into this process isn't diminished. It's not less than it used to be. It's actually more than it used to be. You now have the opportunity to take not just your expertise in this area to bring that to bear on somebody, but you have your, your expertise in understanding how to think and how to engage resources and how to, how to engage communities. All the stuff you had to do to earn your degree, not, the, not just the content, but all the stuff you had to think about and learn how to do, all of that stuff gets to come to bear now on the educational journey, rather than just you teaching about one thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, in a, it's in a, a, I would suggest a more, a fuller understanding of what it could be that a faculty brings. Um, the, the content and the academy and the history and tradition of, of what we have done as the academy is valid and important and vital. But there's just so much more that we could do. <laughs> there's so much more. We just limit ourselves to classrooms. We lose sight of, I think, what God mm -hmm. could be doing around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. what if yeah. I asked then the question from the other side of the table? 
um, you know, you just got Michael really excited as the academic, as the faculty, as him dreaming it again, uh, himself in that role as that educator, that leader, you know, Michael, who was my professor. So I have appreciated what Michael's brought to the table, but let's go to the other side of the table. Uh, why, why should somebody who is the everyman, the, the plumber, the electrician, the hospital administrator, uh, I, I certainly know we've touched on it, but why should they engage in theological education? Not, I mean, clearly with Kairos, that's what we're talking about, but in general, why? Why should the everyman continue to pursue theological education in this way? So I, I think, uh, so I listened to your, your interview with Scott Manor, actually, and his answer is the same one I would give. <laughs> he referenced a little bit of the, the Justo Gonzalez stuff and the kind of history of theological education. And so my reaction to why should someone engage in theological education, the answer is because everybody who's a follower of Jesus should. The, if you are a follower of Jesus, that's an invitation to embrace the the what we, what we call integrated knowledge of following Jesus. Um, so it's um, it, that's why we use content, character, and craft. You need to you need to have some cognitive understanding, yes, but you also your character needs to be formed and shaped, and then you need to be able to do stuff with other people. So that's the content, character, and craft. Those three things together are what are knowledge. Uh, knowledge as construed as just ideas or just things that we can articulate. That's not knowledge. That's just cognitive understanding. And so as a Them's follower facts. of Jesus. Yeah, facts, right? It's we I can name some facts, but you can name the fact that Jesus is Lord, but not actually know that Jesus is Lord, um, because it's not evident in the the way you're participating mm -hmm. in the kingdom, right? So you can simultaneously pro you know articulate the gospel without proclaiming the gospel at the same time. They're simultaneously possible. And so I would suggest if you're a follower of Jesus, part of that invitation is engaging in the the understanding of who god is and what god is doing in the world and how we're invited to participate in that i think what we as the seminaries have done is we've kind of bifurcated the what what historically has been called informal theological education well there's there's yeah there's the stuff that churches should be doing and then there's formal theological education and i think some of the great things that Husto does in his book is back in the day they weren't different right <laughs> there was there was one journey of theological education and you did it whether you were a bishop or the person showing up uh, every week to the, to the meal. It was the same thing. And the beauty with, I think, the systems that Scott's trying to do, we're taking stuff to the church, and some of the stuff that we're doing at, at Kairos is recognizing that you don't have to have that bifurcation of formal and informal. What really governs whether or not it, you're getting a degree is the kind of assessment associated with it. Not, the, not necessarily the content, not necessarily the engagement, but if you have somebody with a PhD like Michael, who is assessing that and, and articulating it inside of a particular structure of a degree, then you can earn a degree. But that doesn't mean everybody should not study Ephesians and know a little bit about what Ephesians is doing. So mm. as seminaries, we have to create collaborative engagements that make it possible for students to follow Jesus. When we started Kairos, we had all kinds of people say, hey, well, how does somebody who doesn't want a degree engage in this? What if they just want to study, study the Bible and, and do that in the context of people? We said, well, they can totally do that. And what we have seen after nine years of doing that is if you say to someone, hey, you can study and we can work with you and it costs you know, $50 a month or $100 a month, which is a steal for, for some things. They're like, oh, that's great. And then they hear, but you could have a mentor team and access to a global community and it's only $300 a month people are like, well, why wouldn't I just do that? <laughs> and so we have, we have zero certificate students. Um, we have, everybody who's in Kairos, for the most part, is pursuing a degree, not because they want a degree, but because they want to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then because you can start any month, you can also stop any month. And so we do have students who start, they're in the degree program, they're in it for a year, and then they're like, actually, I think I'm where God wants me to be. Awesome bless you. <laughs> go, go and go and follow Jesus in your vocation. Um, right. And it doesn't so mean that that time that they were with Kairos was wasted time correct. or that what they have learned or how they have been equipped was for not just because they didn't cross the finish line that resulted in extra letters after their name. They Exactly. And we are the ones that are defining that that should like the seminaries world have 
constructed this thing that the finish line is the degree. And what we're trying to say is the finish line is following Jesus and flourishing in your vocation, period. Mm. That, the, that's the finish line. So if you happen to get a degree, awesome. Praise Alleluia. Cool. Now you can serve other people with that degree. Awesome. But if you're flourishing in your vocation and you didn't finish the degree, then awesome. So I would suggest that graduation rates may not actually be the best indication. They are, they are an indication in the old systems. People would use graduation rates as an indication of how schools are doing. And I'm saying in this new era and where we're going, maybe we need to not use that as, a, as the, the goal. We need to use something else as the, the measure of was a student successful. Yeah, great. Well, I love the innovative thinking, the creative thinking that's going on here, Greg. So appreciate you and the work that you've been doing and uh, grateful that we're able to partner with Kairos and uh, looking forward to uh, how that partnership will grow and how it will contribute to the work of the kingdom around the world. What, uh, what degrees right now do we have, Michael, at least on the table today? What degrees is our ephesiology, well, is because we are the institution, if you will, ephesiology master classes, partnering with Kairos. If somebody is going to get a degree with this wonderful tandem, what degrees are we offering? Well, three primary, the Master of Arts degree, the Master of Divinity degree, and the Doctor of Ministry degree. And again, as Greg has uh, so uh, beautifully articulated, these are contextual degrees. And so what I'm excited about in terms of ephesiology's participation with Kairos is that we have a real focus in three areas, in gospel proclamation, in defense of the faith, and in social justice. And so in each of these degrees, the MA, MDiv, and DMIN, uh, we're concentrating in those areas as uh, key strategic areas for us to think about uh, how we're engaging our communities uh, wherever we are with the gospel, uh, whether it's in a uh, place of, of work, uh, in, a, in a school or a hospital or an office, or if it's in a vocational ministry, that we want to be thinking about how do we effectively uh, engage in those areas. So um, as our listeners know, that's been our heart, our focus, and so excited that we have a number of faculty that work with us in this as well. It's very exciting. Well, Scott, it looks like we're trying to land this plane. So uh, I called you Scott. Greg, if this is your fault. You brought up Scott last. So I'm happy uh, to be called Scott. Scott's a good dude. Uh, Greg, are there any other um, kind of parting shots, uh, words of encouragement you want to leave with our listeners about um, Kairos or the goals that God has given you all in this season? I, mean, I, I don't know that I have anything about Kairos. I think it's more uh, if you've got people who are listening to this and hearing some of the stuff that I know a physiology does. Uh, that's more of a just lean into that. Lean into what God's inviting you to do. Um, find ways to to bring other people alongside you. Like it's an encouragement to say, God is up to some amazing things around the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes, especially in the West and in the North America, we we kind of lament like, oh, the the church and like God's church is thriving, absolutely thriving. It just might look different <laughs> than than what we're used to. So if you're mm. listening to this, just God is doing some so cool things. Jump mm. in f and see what the Spirit's up to. It might be something different. It might be something challenging. It might be something that you disagree with. But uh, if if the church didn't engage in things that it disagreed with, there none of us would be here in this conversation. Mm. You know, at Acts 15, James would have said, you're right, no Gentiles. No Gentiles can come. But that's not what the church has done, right? And so we have to be open and, and willing to just say, man, the Spirit's up to some stuff. I don't, I don't understand it all, but let's, let's just lean into that. Mm, good word. Absolutely. Well, I, I will only echo Greg as kind of this encouragement uh, listener. When we talk about the church engaging in these things, we are talking about you. The goal is not to talk about your niece or your cousin or your neighbor down the road and what they might need. 
while that all still might be true, you're the one listening, and we want to encourage you to pursue God where he is already working, run alongside him and see how he is going to use you for the growth of his kingdom and for your growth in Jesus. So thank you very much for listening to our Ephesiology podcast today with Greg Henson, president of Kairos University. Uh, Thank you for giving us your time and hopefully your heart during this as Holy Spirit is moving and doing things. If you have been stirred, uh, Greg, where can they engage both with you or with Kairos in the next steps? So you can go on our website. Obviously, there's all kinds of stuff there, but the I'm actually a really open and transparent person. So they can email me directly if people want to. Uh, my name, my email address is just my first initial, last name. So Henson at kairos.edu. Happy to talk to anybody. Okay. Well, with all that we have laid out, clearly we want to invite you to check out Ephesiology Masterclasses. Go on to our website, ephesiology.com. Click all the corresponding links. You can get wonderful resources as well as perhaps take steps to starting your degree through Ephesiology Masterclasses and Kairos University. Uh, Again, thank you for joining us today. Greg, thank you for your time. Michael, also for your wisdom and the interaction. Uh, Matt, we will see you again soon. But thank you for joining us on the Ephesiology Podcast.